Book 12. The Sword Decides All. Once Turnus sees his ranks of Latins broken in battle, their spirits dashed and the war god turned against them. Now is the time, he knows, for him to keep his pledge. All eyes are fixed on him. His blood is up and nothing can quench the fighter's ardor now. Think of the lion raging the fields near Carthage. The beast won't move into battle till he takes a deep wound in his chest from the hunters. Then he revels in combat, tossing the rippling mane on his neck. He snaps the spear some stalker drove in his flesh and roars from bloody jaws without a fear in the world. So Turnus blazes up into a full explosive fury, bursting out at the king with reckless words. Turnus spurns all delay. Now there's no excuse for those craven sons of Aeneas to break their word, to forsake the pact we swore. I'll take him on, I will. Bring on the sacred rites, father. Draft our binding terms. Either my right arm will send that Darden down to hell, that rank deserter of Asia. My armies can sit back and watch, and Turnus' sword alone will rebut the charge of cowardice trained against them all. Or let him reign over those he's beaten down. Let Lavinia go to him, his bride. Latinus replied in a calming, peaceful way. Brave of the brave, my boy, the more you excel in feats of daring, the more it falls to me to weigh the perils, with all my fears, the lethal risks we run. The realms of your father, Donus, are yours to manage. So are the many towns your right arm took by force. Latinus, too, has wealth and the will to share it. We've other unwed girls in Latian and Laurentine fields, and no mean stock at that. So let me offer this. Hard as it is, yet free and clear of deception. Take it to heart, I urge you. For me to unite my daughter with any one of her former suitors would have been wrong, forbidden. All the gods and prophets made that plain. But I bowed to my love of you, bowed to our kindred blood and my wife's heart-rending tears. I broke all bonds. I tore the promised bride from her waiting groom. I brandished a wicked sword. Since then, Turnus, you see what assaults, what crises dog my steps, what labors you have shouldered, you first of all. Beaten twice in major battles, our city walls can scarcely harbor Italy's future hopes. The rushing Tiber still gleams with our blood, the endless fields still glisten with our bones. Why do I shrink from my decision? What insanity shifts my fixed resolve? If, with Turnus dead, I am ready to take the Trojans on as allies. Why not stop the war while he is still alive? What will your Rutulians, all the rest of Italy, say if I betray you to death? May fortune forbid. Will you appeal for my daughter's hand in marriage? Oh, think back on the twists and turns of war. Pity your father, bent with years and grief, cut off from you in your native city, Ardea, far away. Latinus is urging, deflect the fury of Turnus, not one bit. It only surges higher. The attempts to heal inflame the fever more. Soon as he finds his breath, the prince breaks out. The anguish you bear for my sake, generous king, for my sake, I beg you, wipe it from your mind. Let me barter death as the price of fame. I have weapons too, old father, and no weak, untempered spears go flying from my right hand. From the wounds we deal, the blood comes flowing, too. His mother, the goddess, she'll be far from his side with her woman's wiles, lurking in her in stealthy shadows, hiding him in clouds when her hero cuts and runs. But the queen, afraid of the new rules of engagement, wept and bent on her own death, embraced her ardent son-in-law to be. Turnus, by these tears of mine, by any concern for Amata that moves your heart, you are my only hope now. You are the one relief to my wretched old age. In your hands alone, the glory and power of King Latinus rest. You alone can shore our sinking house. One favor now, I pray you. Refrain from going hand to hand with the Trojans. Whatever dangers await you in that one skirmish, Turnus awaits me too. With you, I will forsake the light of this life I hate. Never in shackles live to see Aeneas as my son. As Lavinia heard her mother's pleas, her warm cheeks bathed in tears, a blush flamed up and infused her glowing features. 
as crimson as Indian ivory stained with ruddy dye, or white lilies aglow in a host of scarlet roses, so mixed the hues that lit the young girl's face. Turnus, struck with love, fixing his eyes upon her, fired the more for combat, tells Amada briefly, Don't, I beg you, mother, send me off with tears, with evil omens as I go into the jolting shocks of war, since Turnus is far from free to defer his death. Be my messenger, Idmon. Take my words to Aeneas, hardly words to please that craven Phrygian king. Soon as the sky goes red with tomorrow's dawn, riding Aurora's blood-red chariot wheels, he's not to hurl his Trojans against our Latins. He must let Trojan and Latian armies stand at ease. Our blood will put an end to this war at last. That's the field where Lavinia must be won. No more words. Rushing back to the palace, Turnus calls for his team and thrills to see them neighing right before him. Gifts from Orithia herself to glorify Polumnius, horses whiter than snow, swifter than racing winds. Restless charioteers flank them, patting their chests, slapping with cupped hands, and grooming their rippling manes. Next, Turnus buckles round his shoulders the breastplate, dense with its golden mesh and livid mountain bronze, and straps on sword, shield, and helmet with horns for its bloody crest. That sword the fire god forged for Father Donus, plunged red hot in the river Styx. And next, with his powerful grip, he snatches up a burly spear, a slant, an enormous central column. Plunder seized from an enemy, actor, shakes it hard till the haft quivers, and, Now my spear, he cries, you've never failed my call, and now our time has come. Great actor wielded you once, now you're in Turnus's hands. Let me spill his corpse on the ground and strip his bless breastplate, Rip it to bits with my bare hands, that Phrygian eunuch. Defile his hair in the dust, his tresses crimped, with a white-hot curling iron dripping myrrh. Frenzy drives him. Turnus's whole face is ablaze, showering sparks, his dazzling glances glinting fire. Terrible, bellowing like some bull before the fight begins. Trying to pour his fury into his horns, he rams a tree trunk, charges the wind's full force, stamping sprays of sand as he warms up for battle. At the same time, Aeneas, just as fierce in the arms his mother gave him, hones his fighting spirit too and incites his anger, glad the war will end with the pact that Turnus offers. Then he eases his friends and anxious Ulysses' fears, explaining the ways of fate, commanding envoys now to return his firm reply to King Latinus, state the terms of peace. A new day was just about to dawn, scattering light on the mountaintops. The horses of the sun, just rearing up from the ocean's depth, death, depths, <laughs> breathing forth the light from their flaring nostrils when the Latins and Trojans were pacing off the dueling ground below the great city's walls, spacing the braziers out between both armies, mounting the grassy altars high to the gods they shared in common. Others, cloaked in their sacred aprons, brows wreathed in verbena, brought out spring water and sacramental fire. The Italian troops march forth, pouring out of the packed gates in tight masked ranks, and fronting them, the entire Trojan and Tuscan force comes rushing up, decked out in a range of arms, no less equipped with iron than if the brutal war god called them forth to battle. And there, in the midst of milling thousands, chiefs paraded left and right, resplendent in all their purple and gold regalia. Menestheus, blood's kin of Asaracus, Asa, hardly Asilus, then Mesippus, breaker of horses, Neptune's son. The signal sounds. All withdraw to their stations, plant spears in the ground, and cant their shields against them. Then, in an avid stream, the mothers and unarmed crowds and frail old men find seats on towers and rooftops. Others take their stand on the high gates. But Juno, looking out from a ridge now, called the Alban Mount, then it had neither name, renown, nor glory, gazed down on the plain, on Italian and Trojan armies face to face, and Latinus's city walls. At once she called to Turnus's sister, goddess to goddess, the lady of lakes and rilling brooks. 
to an honor the high and mighty king of heaven bestowed on J Jaturna, whence he ravished the virgin girl. Nymph, beauty of streams, our heart's desire. Well, you know how I have favored you. You above all the Italian women who have mounted that ungrateful bed of our warm-hearted Jove, I gladly assign you a special place in heaven. So learn, Jaturna, the grief that comes your way, and don't blame me. While fortune seemed to allow and fate to suffer the Latian state to thrive, I guarded Turnus, guarded your city walls. But now I see the soldier facing unequal odds, his day of doom, his enemy's blows approaching. That duel, that deadly pact, I cannot bear to watch. But if you dare to help your brother at closer range, go and do so. It becomes you. Who knows? Better times may come to those in pain. Juno had barely closed when tears brimmed in Juturna's eyes, and three, four times over she beat her lovely breast. No time for tears now, warned Saturn's daughter. Hurry, pluck your brother from death, if there is a way, or drum up war and abort that treaty they conceived. The design is mine, the daring yours. Spurring her on, Juno left Juturna torn, distraught with the wound that broke her heart. As the kings come riding in, a massive four-horse chariot draws Latinus forth, his glistening temples ringed by a dozen gilded rays, proof he owes his birth to the sun god's line. And a snow-white pair bring Turnus's chariot on, two steel-tipped javelins balanced in his grip. And coming to meet them, marching from the camp, the great founder, Aeneas, source of the Roman race, with his blazoned starry shield and armor made in heaven. And at his side, his son, Ascanius, second hope of Rome's imposing power, while a priest in pure white robes leads on the young of a bristly boar and an unshorn yearly sheep toward the flaming altars. Turning their eyes to face the rising sun, the captains reach out their hand, pouring the salted meal, and mark off the brows of the victims, cutting tufts with iron blades, and tip their cups on the sacred altar fires. Then devoted Aeneas, sword drawn, prays, Now let the sun bear witness here, and this, this land of Italy that I call. For your sake I am able to bear such hardships, and Jove Almighty, and you, his queen Saturnia. Goddess, be kinder now, I pray you, now at last. And you, Father Glorious Mars, you who command the revolving world of war beneath your sway, I call on the springs and streams, the gods enthroned in the arching sky and the gods of the deep blue sea. If by chance the victory goes to the Latin, Turnus, we agree that the defeated will depart to Evander's city. Eulus will leave this land. Nor will Aeneas's Trojans ever revert in times to come, take up arms again, and threaten to put this kingdom to the sword. But if victory grants our force and arms the day, as I think she may, May the gods decree it so. I shall not command Italians to bow to Trojans, nor do I seek the scepter for myself. May both nations, undefeated, under equal laws, march together toward an eternal pact of peace. I shall bestow the gods and their sacred rights. My father-in-law, Latinus, will retain his armies. My father-in-law, his power, his rightful rule. The men of Troy will erect a city for me. Lavinia will give its walls her name. So Aeneas begins, and so Latinus follows, eyes lifted aloft, his right hand raised to the sky. I swear by the same, Aeneas, earth and sea and stars, by Latona's brood of twins, by Janus facing left and right, by the gods who rule below and the shrine of ruthless death. May the father hear my oath, his lightning seal all, seals all packs. My hand on his altar now, I swear by the gods and fires that rise between us here. The day will never dawn when Italian men will break this pact, this peace, however fortune falls. No power can bend awry my will, not if that power sends the country avalanching into the waves, roiling all in floods and plunging the heavens into the dark pit of hell. Just as surely as this scepter, raising the scepter, he chanced to be grasping it in his hands, will never sprout new green or scatter shade from its tender leaves. Now that it's been cut from its trunk's base in the woods, cleft from its mother, 
its limbs and crowning foliage lost to the iron axe. A tree once that a craftsman's hands have sheathed in hammered bronze and given the chiefs, chiefs of Latium state to wield. So, on such termed, terms, they sealed a pact of peace between both sides, witnessed by all the officers of the armies. Then they slash the throats of the hallowed victims over the flames and tear the puls pulsing entrails out and heap the altars high with groaning platters. But in fact, the duel had long seemed uneven to all the Rutulians. Long their hearts were torn, wavering back and forth, and they only wavered more as they viewed the two contenders at closer range, poorly matched in power. Turnus adds to their anguish, quietly moving toward the altar, eyes downcast to pray. A suppliant now, his fresh cheeks and his strong young body pallid. Soon as his sister Juturna saw such murmurs rise, and the hearts of people slipping into doubt, into the lines she goes like hammers to the life. A soldier sprung from a grand ancestral clan, his father a name for valor, brilliant deeds, and he himself renowned for feats of arms. Into the center lines, Juturna strides, alert to the work at hand, and she sows a variety of rumors, urging, Aren't you ashamed, Rutulians, putting at risk the life of one to save us all? Don't we match them in numbers, power? Look, these are all they've got, Trojans, Arcadians, and all the Etruscan forces, slaves to fate, to battle Turnus in arms. Why, if only half of us went to war, each soldier could fi hardly find a foe. But Turnus, think, he'll rise on the wings of fame to meet the gods, gods on whose altar he has offered up his life. He will live forever, sung on the lips of men. But if we lose our land, we'll bow to the yoke, enslaved by our new high lords and masters, we, we who idle on amid our fields. Stinging taunts inflame the will of the fighters all the more, till a low-growing murmur steals along the lines. Even Laurentines, even Latins change their tune. Men who had just now longed for peace and safety, long for weapons, pray the pact be dashed, and pity the unjust face that fate that Turnus faces. Then, crowning all, Juturna adds a greater power. She displays in the sky the strongest sign that ever dazed Italian minds and deceived them with its wonders. The golden eagle of Jove, in flight through the blood-red sky, was harrying shorebirds, rooting their squadrons, shrieking ranks, when suddenly, down he swoops to the stream and grasps a swan, out in the lead, in his ruthless talons. This the Italians watch, enthralled as the birds all scream and swerving round in flight. A marvel, look, they overshadow the sky with wings and forming a dense cloud bank, force their enemy high up through the air until, beaten down by their strikes and, its vic and his victim's weight, his talons drop the kill and the rivers run and into the clouds the eagle winged away. Struck, the Italians shout out, Saluting that great omen, all hands eager to take up arms, and the augur Tolumnius urges first. This, this, he cries, is the answer to all my prayers. I embrace it. I recognize the gods. I, I will lead you. Reach for your swords now, my poor people. Like helpless birds, terrorized by war, that ruthless invader brings you, devastated your shores by force of arms. He too will race in flight and wing away setting his sail to cross the farthest seas. Close ranks, every man of you mass with one resolve. Fight to save your king, the marauder seized. Enough. Lunging out, he whips his spear at the foes he faced, and the whizzing javelin hisses, rips the air dead on. And at that instant, a huge outcry. Ranks in a wedge in disarray, lines buckling, hearts at fever pitch as the shaft Wings on were a band of nine brothers with fine bodies chanced to block its course. One mother bore them all, a Tuscan, a loyal Tyrena wed to Gilippus, her Arcadian husband. And one of these, in the waist where the braided belt chafes the flesh and the buckle clasps the strap from end to end, a striking, well-built soldier in burnished bronze, the spear splits his ribs and splays him out on the sand. But his brothers, a phalanx, up in arms, inflamed by grief, 
Some tear swords from sheaths, and some snatch up their spears, and all press blindly on. As the Latian columns charge them, charging them through Agalines and Trojans streaming up with Arcadian ranks decked out in blazoned gear, and one lust drives them all to let the sword decide. Altars plundered for torches, down from menacing clouds, a torrent of spears, and the iron rain pelts thick and fast as they carry off the holy bowls and sacred braziers. Even Latinus flees, cradling his defeated gods and shattered packs of peace. Others harness teams to chariots, others vault up into their horses, swords brandished, tents for attack. Mesippus, keen to disrupt the truce, whips his charger straight at Tuscan Aulestes, king adorned with his kingly emblems, forcing him back in terror. <clears throat> and back he trips, poor man, stumbling, crashing head over shoulders into the altar rearing behind him there. And Mesippus, fired up now, flies at him, looming over him, high in the saddle to strike him dead with his rugged, beamy lance, the king begging for mercy, Mesippus shouting, This one's finished? Here, a choicer victim offered up to the great gods, and the Latins rush to strip the corpse still warm. <clears throat> Rushing to block them, Corineus grabs a flaming torch from the altar, just so Abesus can't strike first, and hurls fire in the Latin's face, and his huge beard flares up, reeking with burnt singe. And following on that blow, he seizes his dazed foe's locks in his left hand and pins him fast to the ground with a knee full force and digs his rigid blade into Abesus' flank. Podalirius, tracking the shepherd Alsus, hurtles through the front with a spear's shower down. He's rearing over him now with his naked sword, but Alsus, swirling his axe head back, strikes him square in the skull, cleaving brow to chin, and convulsive sprays of blood imbrue his armor. <clears throat> Grim repose and an iron sleep press down his eyes and shut their light in night that never ends. But Aeneas, bound to his oath, his head exposed and, his, and the hand unarmed, he was stretching towards his comrades, shouting, shouted out, Where are you running? Why this sudden outbreak? Why these clashes? Rein your anger in. The pact's already struck. Its terms are set. Now I alone have the right to enter combat. Don't hold me back. Cast your fears to the wind. This strong right arm will put our truce to the proof. Our rights have already made the life of Turnus mine. <clears throat> Just in the midst of these, these outcries, look. A winging arrow whizzes in and it hits Aeneas. Nobody knows who shot it, whirled it on to bring the Rutulians such renown. What luck, what god, the shining fame of the feet is shrouded over now. Nobody boasted he had struck Aeneas. No one. Turnus, soon as he saw Aeneas falling back from the lines, his chiefs in disarray, ignites with the blaze of hope. He demands his team and arms at once. In a flash of pride, he leaps up onto his chariot, tugging hard on the reins, and races on, and droves of the brave he hands to death, and tumbles droves of the half-dead down to earth, or crushes whole detachments under his wheels, or, seizing their lances, cuts down all who cut and run. A mock as Mars by the banks of the Hebrus frozen over, splattered with blood, fired to fury, drumming his shield as he whips up war and gives his frenzied team free rein, and over the open fields they outstrip the winds from the south and west, till the far frontiers of Thrace groan to their pounding hoofs, and round him the shapes of black fear, rage, and ambush. Aids of the war god gallop on and on. Just so madly, Turnus whips his horses into the heart of battle, chargers steaming sweat, trampling enemy fighters killed in agony, kicking gusts of bloody spray, their hoofs stamping into the sand the clotted gore. Now he's dealing death to Sthenelus, Thamrius, Pholus, Sthenelus speared at long range, the next two hand to hand. <clears throat> at a distance, too, both sons of Embrassus, Glaucus and Ladies. Embrassus had reared them himself in, Gly in Lycia once, 
and equip them both with marching weapons either to fight close up or outrace the winds on horseback. Another sector, Eumides, charges into the melee, grandson of old Eumides, bearing that veteran's name, but famed for his father's Dolan's heart in hand in war. Dolan, who once dared to ask for Achilles' chariot, his reward for spying out the Achaean camp. But Diomedes paid his daring a different reward. Now he no longer dreams of the horses of Achilles. Eumides, spotting him far out on the open meadow, Turnus hits him first with a light spear winged across that empty space, then races up to him, halts his team, and rearing over the dying Trojan, plants a foot on his neck and tears the sword from his grip. A flash of the blade, he stains it red in the man's throat. And to top it off, cries out, Look here, Trojan, here are the fields, the great land of the West you fought to win in war. Lie there, take their measure. That's the reward they all will carry off who risk my blade. That's how they build their walls. A whirl of his spear, and Turnus sp sends Aspides to join him. Chlorius too, and Sibaris, Darius, Thersilochus, then Thyamedes, pitch down over the neck of his buckling horse, or bucking horse. Like a blast of the Thracian north wind howling over the deep Aegean, whipping the waves toward shore, wherever the winds burst down the clouds take flight through the sky. So Turnus, wherever he hacks his path, the lines buckle in and the ranks turn tail and run as his own drive sweeps him on, his rushing chariot charging the gusts that toss his crest. Phegeus now, or Phegeus could not face his assault, his deafening cries. He flung himself before the chariot, right hand wrestling the horse's jaws around as they came charging into him frothing at their bits, then dragged him dangling down from the yoke as Turnus's spearhead hit his exposed flank, and ripping the double links of his breastplate, there it stuck, just grazing the fighter's skin. But raising his shield, swerving to brave his foe, he strained to save himself with his naked sword, when the wheel and whirling axle knocked him headlong, ground him into the dust. Turnus, Finishing up with a stroke between the helmet's base and the breastplate's upper rim, hacked off his head and left his trunk in the sand. And now, while Turnus is spreading death across the plains in all his triumph, Menestheus and trusty Achates, Ascanius at their side, are setting Aeneas down in camp, bleeding, propping himself on his lengthy spear at every other step. Furious, struggling to tear the broken arrowhead out, he insists they take the quickest way to heal him. Cut the wound with a broadsword. Open it wide. Dig out the point where it's bedded deep and put me back into action. Now up comes Eopix, Iasus' son, and dear to Apollo, more than all other men. And once, in the anguished grip of love, the god himself gladly offered him all his own arts, his gifts, his prophetic skills, his lyre, his flying shafts. But he... Desperate to slow the death of his dying father, preferred to master the power of herbs, the skills that cure, and pursue a healer's practice, silent and unsung. But Aeneas, pressed by a crowd of friends and Eulus grieving sorely, the fighter stood there unbridled, fuming, hunched on his rugged spear, unmoved by all their tears. <clears throat> the old surgeon, his robe tucked back and cinched in the healer's way, with his expert healing hands and Apollo's potent herbs, he works for all he's worth. No use. No use as his right hand tugs at the shaft and his clamping forceps grip the iron point. No good luck guides his probes. Apollo the master lends no help, and all the while the ruthless horror of war grows greater, grimmer throughout the field, a disaster ever close. Now they see a pillar of dust upholding the sky, and the horsemen riding on in dense salvos of weapons raining down in the camp's heart, and the cries of torment reaching the heavens as young men fight and die beneath the iron fist of Mars. At this point, Venus, shocked by the unfair pain her son endures, culls with a mother's care some dittany fresh from Cretan Ida, spear erect with its tender leaves and crown of purple flowers, no stranger to wild goats who graze it when flying arrows are planted in their backs. This she bears away, her features veiled in a heavy mist, 
This she distills in secret into the river, poured in burnished bowls, and fills them with healing power, and sprinkles ambrosial juices bringing health, and redolent cure-all too. With this potion, aged Eopix laved the wound, quite unaware, and suddenly all the pain dissolved from Aeneas's body, all the blood that pooled in his wound stanched, and the shaft, with no force required, slipped out into the healer's hand, and the old strength came back, fresh as it was at first. Quick, fetch him his weapons. Don't just stand there, Eapix cried, the first to inflame their hearts against the flow. The foe. This strong cure, it's none of the work of human skills, no expert's arts in action. My right hand, Aeneas, never saved your life. Something greater, a god, is speeding you back to greater exploits. Starved for war, Aeneas had cased his calves in gold, left and right, in spurning delay, he shakes his glinting spear. Once he has fitted shield to hip and harness to his back, he clasps Ascanius fast in an iron-clad embrace and kisses him lightly through his visor, says, Learn courage from me, my son, true hardship too. Learn good luck from others. My hand will shield you in war today and guide you toward the great rewards. But mark my words, soon as you ripen into manhood, reaching back for the models of your kin, remember, Father Aeneas and Uncle Hector fire your heart. Urging's over, out of the gates he strode, immense in strength, waving his massive spear. Antheus and Menestheus flank him closely, dashing on, and from the deserted camp roll all their swarming ranks. The field is a swirl of blinding dust, the earth quaking under their thundering tread. <clears throat> from the opposing rampart, Turnus saw them coming on. His Italians saw them too, and an icy chill of dread ran through their bones. First in the Latin ranks, Juturna caught the sound. She knew what it meant, and seized with trembling, fled. <clears throat> but Aeneas flies ahead, spurring his dark ranks on, and storming over the open fields like a cloudburst, wiping out the sun, sweeping over the seas toward land. And well in advance, the poor unlucky farmers, hearts shuddering, know what it will bring. Trees uprooted, crops destroyed, their labor in ruins far and wide. And the winds come first, churning in uproar toward the shore. So the Trojans storm in, their commander heading them toward the foe, their tight ranks packed in a wedge, comrade linked with comrade massing hard. A slash of a sword, Thimbraeus finished, finished giant Osiris. Menestheus kills Arcidius. Achates hacks uh, Epulo down, and Gaius euphens. Even the seer Tolumnius falls, the first to wing a lance against the foe. Cries hit the heavens. Now it's the Latin's time to turn tail and flee across the fields in a cloud of dust. Aeneas never stoops to level, leveling men who show their backs, or makes for... Or makes for for the one who fights him fairly, toe to toe, or the ones who fling their spears at longer range. No, it's Turnus alone he's tracking, eyes alert through the murky haze of battle, and Turnus alone Aeneas demands to fight. Juturna, terror struck at the thought, the woman warrior knocks Metiscus, Turnus's charioteer, from, behind, from between the reins, he grasps, and leave it, leaves him sprawling far from the chariot pole, as she herself takes over, shaking the rippling reins like Metiscus to the life, his voice, his build, his gear. Quick as a black swift darts along through the great halls of a wealthy lord and scavenging morsels, banquet scraps for her chirping nestlings. All her twitterings echo now in the empty colonnades, now round the brimming ponds. So swiftly, Juturna drives her team at the Trojan center, darts along in her chariot, whirling through the field. Now here, there, displaying her brother in his glory. True, but she never lets him come to grips. She swerves far away. But Aeneas, no less bent on meeting up with the enemy, stalks his victims, circling round him, turn by turn, and his shrill cries call him through the broken ranks. As often as he caught sight of his prey and strained out stripped the speed of that team that raced the wind, so often, Juturna wheeled the chariot round and swooped away. What should he do? 
No hope. He seethes on a heaving sea as warring anxieties call him back and forth. Then Messippus, just sprinting along with a pair of steel-tipped spears in his left hand, training one on the Trojan, lets it fly right on target. Aeneas stopped in his tracks and huddled under his shield, crouched down on a knee, but the spear in its onrush swiped the peak of his helmet off and swept away the plumes that crowned his crest. Aeneas erupts in anger, stung by the treachery now, and seeing Turnus's horses swing his chariot round and speed away, over and over he calls out to Jove, to the altars built for the treaty now a shambles. Then at last he hurtles into the thick of battle, as Mars drives him on, and terrible, savage, inciting slaughter, sparing none, he gives his rage free reign. Now what god can enfold for me so many terrors? Who can make a song of slaughter in all its forms, the deaths of captains down the entire field, dealt now by Turnus, now by Aeneas, kill for kill? Did it please you so, great Jove, to see the world at war, the people's clash that would later live in everlasting peace? Aeneas takes on Rutulian Sucro. Here was the first duel that ground the Trojan charge to a halt and meets the man with no long visit, just a quick stab in his flank, and the ruthless sword blade splits the rib cage, thrusting into the heart where death comes lightning fast. Turnus, hurtling, hurling the brothers Amicus and Diores off their mounts, attacks them on foot, and one he strikes with a long spear, rushing at Turnus, one he runs through with sword and severing both their heads. He dangles them from his car as he carts them off in triumph, dripping blood. <clears throat> Aeneas packs them off to death. Talos, Tanias, staunch Sethagus, Seth all three at a single charge. Then grim Oneides, too, named for his Theban line, his mother called Peridia. Turnus kills the brothers fresh from Apollo's Lycian fields, and next Minoides, who, in his youth, detested war, but war would be his fate. An Arcadian angler skilled at working the rivers of Lerna stocked with fish, his lodgings poor, a stranger to all the gifts of the great, and his father farmed his crops on rented land. Like fires loose from adverse sides into woodlands dry as tinder, thickets of rus rus rustling laurel, or foaming rivers hurling down from a mountain's ridge and roaring out to sea, each leaves a path of destruction in its wake. Just as furious now those two, Aeneas, Turnus, rampaging through the battle, now their fury boils over inside them, now their warring hearts at the breaking point. They don't concede defeat, and now they hack their wounding ways with all their force. Here is Moranus, sounding off the names of his forebears, all his father's father's line from the start of time, his entire race come down from the Latin kings. Headlong down, Aeneas smashes the braggart with a rock, a whirling boulder, pow boulder's power that splays him on the ground, snarled in the reins and yoke as the wheels roll him on, and under their thundering hoofbeats, both his galloping horses, all thought of their master vanished, trample him to death. Here's Hylas rushing in with his blood-curdling rage, but Turnus rushes to block him, whips a spear at his brow that splits his gilded helmet, sticks erect in his brain. And your sword arm, Cretheus, bravest Greek afield, it could not snatch you from Turnus, nor did the gods he worshipped save Cupincus's life when Aeneas came his way. He thrust his chest at the blade, but his brazen shield, poor priest, could not put off his death. And Aeolus, you too, the Laurentine fields saw you go down, and your body spread across the earth. Down you went, whom neither the Greek battalions could demolish, nor could Achilles, who raised the realms of Priam. Here was your finish line, the end of life. Your halls lie under Ida, high halls at Lyrnissus, but here in Laurentine soil lies your tomb. All on attack, the armies wheeling around for combat, all the Latins, all the Trojans, Menestheus, fierce Cerestus, Messippus, breaker of horses, Brani Asilus, the Etruscan squadron, Evander's Arcadian wings, each fighter at peak strength, all force put to the test as they soldier on, 
No rest, no let up, total war. And now, his lovely mother impelled Aeneas to storm the ramparts, hurl his troops at the city, fast, frontal assault, and panic the Latins faced with swift collapse. And he, stalking Turnus through the moil of battle, Aeneas glances roving left and right, sights the town untouched by this ruthless war, immune, at peace, and an instant vision of fiercer combat fires his soul. He summons Menestheus, Sergestus, staunch Seristus, chosen captains, takes his hand on a high ground, on a high rise, where the rest of the Trojan fighters cluster round. Tight ranks that don't throw down their shields, that don't throw down their shields and spears as Aeneas, rising amidst them, urges from the earthwork. No delaying and obeying my orders. Jove backs us now. No slowing down, I tell you. We must strike at once. That city, the cause of the war, the heart of Latinus's realm, unless they bow to the yoke, brought low this very day, I'll topple their smoking rooftops to the ground. What? Wait till Turnus designs to take me on, deigns to take me on? Consents to fight me again, defeated as he is? That city, my people, there is the core and crux of this accursed war. Quick, bring torches. Restore our truce with fire. A call to arms, and they pack in wedge formation, bent on battle, advancing toward the walls in a dense fighting mass. In a moment, you see ladders slanted, brands aflame. Some charge at the gates and cut the sentries down, and others whirl their steel, blot out the sky with spears. Aeneas himself, up in the lead beneath the ramparts, raises his arm and thunders out, upbraiding Latinus, calling the gods. Bear witness, I've been dragged into battle once again. The Latins are our enemies twice over. This is the second ta pact they've shattered. And discord surges up in the panic-stricken citizens, some insisting the gates be flung wide to the Dardans. Yes, and they hail the king himself toward the walls. Others seize on weapons, rush to defend the ramparts. Picture a shepherd tracking bees to their rocky den, closed up in the clefts he fills with scorching smoke, and all inside, alarmed by the danger, swarming round through their stronghold walled with wax, hones sharp their rage to a piercing buzz, and the black reek goes churning through their house, and the rocks hum with a blind din, and the smoke spews out into thin air. Now, a new misfortune assailed the battle-weary Latins, rocking their city to its roots with grief. The queen, when from her house she sees the enemy coming strong, walls assaulted, flames surging up to the roofs, and no Rutulian force in sight to block their way, no troops of Turnus. Then, poor woman, she thinks him killed in the press of battle, and suddenly, lost in the frenzied grip of sorrow, claims that she's the cause, the criminal, source of disaster, shrilling wild words in her crazed, grieving fit, and bent on death, ripping her purple gown for a noose, she knots it high to a rafter, dies in a gruesome death. As soon as the wretched Latin women hear the worst, the queen's daughter Lavinia is the first to tear her golden hair and score her lustrous cheeks, the rest of the women round, women round her mad with grief, and the long halls resound with trilling wails of sorrow. From here, the terrible news goes racing through the city. Spirits plunge, and Latinus, rending his robes to tatters, stunned by his wife's death and his city's fall, fouls his white hair with showers of dust. Turnus, at this point, fighting off on the outskirts of the field, is hunting a few stragglers. Yet he's less avid now, exulting less and less when his horses win the day. But the winds bring him a hint of hidden terrors, mingled cries drifting out of the town in chaos, a muffled din. He cocks his ears, listening, hardly the sound of joy. What am I hearing? Why this enormous grief that rocks the walls, this clamor echoing from the city far away? So he wonders, madly tugging the reins back, and makes the chariot stop. But his sister, changed to look like his charioteer, Metiscus, handling the car and team and reins, she faced him with this challenge. This way, Turnus, we'll hunt these Trojans down where the victory opens up the first way in. 
other hands can defend our city walls. Aeneas hurtles down on the Latins, all out assault, but we can deal out savage deaths to his Trojans. You'll return from the front, no less than Aeneas in numbers killed and battle honors won. My sister, Turnus replies, I recognized you long ago, yes, when you first broke our, up our treaty with your wiles and threw yourself into combat. No hiding your godhood, you can't fool me now. But what Olympian wished it so, who sent you down to bear such heavy labor? Why, to witness your luckless brother's painful death? What can I do now? What new twist of fortune can save me now? I've seen with my own eyes, calling out to me, Turnus, as he fell, Moranus, no one dearer to me survived, a great soldier taken down by a great wound. Unlucky Euphans died before he could see my shame, and the Trojans commandeered his corpse and weapons. Must I bear the sight of Latinus's houses raised, the last thing I needed, and not rebut the ugly slander of Drances with my sword? Shall I cut and run? Shall the country look on Turnus in full retreat? To die, tell me, is that the worst we face? Be good to me now, you shades of the dead below, for the gods above have turned away their favors. Down to you I go, a spirit cleansed, utterly innocent as charged, forever worthy of my great father's fame. The words were still on his lips when, look, Seishis, riding his lathered horse through enemy lines and slashed where an arrow raked his face, comes running up, <clears throat> calling for help, crying the name of Turnus. Turnus, you are a last best hope. Pity your own people. Aeneas strikes like lightning. Up in arms, he threatens to topple Italy's towers, bring them down in ruins. Already the flaming brands go winging toward the roofs. The Latins, their eyes, their looks are trained on you. Latinus, the king himself, moans and groans with doubt. Whom to call his sons? Which pact can he embrace? <clears throat> and now the queen, whose trust lay all in you, she's dead by her own hand. Terrified, she's fled the light of life. Alone before the gates, Mesapus and brave Atinus hold our front line steady, ringed by enemy squadrons packed tight, bristling a jagged crop of naked blades besides. Well, look at you, wheeling your chariot round the abandoned grassy fields. Stunned by pictures of these disasters blurring through his mind, Turnus stood there, staring, speechless, churning with mighty shame, with grief and madness all a swirl in that one fighting heart, with love spurred by rage and a sense of his own worth too. As soon as the shadows were dispersed and the light restored to his mind, he turned his fiery glance toward the ramparts glaring back from his sh chariot to the town. But now, look, a whirlwind of fire goes rolling, story to story, billowing up the sky, and clings fast to a mobile tower, a defense he built himself of wedged, rough-hewn beams, fitting the wheels below it, gangways reared above. Now, now, my sister, the fates are in command. Don't hold me back. Where God and relentless fortune calls us on, that's the way we go. I'm set on fighting Aeneas hand to hand, set, however bitter it is, to meet my death. You'll never see me disgraced again. No more. Insane as it is, I beg you, let me rage before I die. He leapt from his chariot, hit the ground at a run, threw enemies, Trojan spears, and left his sister grieving as he went bursting through the lines. Wild as a boulder, plowing headlong down from a summit, torn out by tempests, whether the storm winds washed it free or the creeping years stole under it, worked it loose, down the cliff it crashes, ruthless crag of rock, bounding over the ground with enormous impact, <clears throat> churning up on its onrush woods and herds and men. So Turnus bursts through the fractured ranks, charging toward the walls where the earth runs red with blood and the winds hiss with spears and, hand flung up, he cries with a ringing voice, Hold back now, you Rutulians. Latins, keep your arms in check. Whatever fortune sins, it's mine. Better for me alone to redeem the pact for you and let my sword decide. All ranks scattered, leaving a no-man's land between them both. 
But Aeneas, the great commander, hearing the name of Turnus, deserts the walls, deserts the citadel's heights, and breaks off all operations, jettisons all delay. He springs in joy, drums his shield, and it thunders terror. As massive as Athos, massive as Eryx, or even Father Apennine himself, roaring out with his glistening oaks, elated to raise his snow-capped brow to the winds. And then, for a fact, the Rutulians, Trojans, all the Italians, those defending the high ramparts, those on attack, who batter the walls' foundations with their rams, all armies strain to turn their glances round and lift their battle armor off their shoulders. Latinus himself is struck that these two giant men, sprung from opposing ends of the earth, have met face to face to let their swords decide. But they, as soon as the battlefield lay clear and level, charge at speed, rifling their spears at long range, then rush to battle with shields and clanging bronze. The earth groans as stroke after stroke they land with naked swords, fortune and fortitude mixed in one assault. Charging like two hostile bulls, fighting up on Silas' woods or to Burnus's ridges, ramping in mortal combat, both brows bent for attack, and the herdsmen back away in fear, and the whole herd stand by, hushed, afraid, and the heifers wait and wonder. <coughs> Who will lord it over the forest? Who will lead the herd? Well, the bulls battle it out, horns butting, locking, goring each other, necks and shoulders roped in blood, and the woods resound as they grunt and bellow out. So they charge Trojan Aeneas and Turnus, son of Donus. Shields cling, and the huge din makes the heavens ring. Jove himself lifts up his scales, balanced, trued, and in them he sets the opposing fates of both. Whom would the labor of battle doom? Whose life would weigh him down to death? Suddenly, Turnus flashes forward, certain he's in the clear, and raising his sword high, rearing to full stretch, strikes, as Trojans and anxious Latins shout out, with the gaze of both armies riveted on the fighters. But his treacherous blade breaks off. It fails Turnus in mid-stroke. Enraged, his one course, retreat, and swifter than east winds, Turnus flies as soon as he sees that unfamiliar hilt in his hand. No defense at all. They say the captain, rushing headlong on to harness his team and board his car to begin the duel, left his father's sword behind, and hastily grabbed his charioteer's metiscus's blade. Long as the Trojan stragglers took to their heels and ran, the weapon did its work. But once it came up against the immortal armor forged by the god of fire, Vulcan, the mortal sword, burst at a stroke, brittle as ice, and glinting splinters gleamed on the tawny sand. So raging Turnus runs for it, scours the field, now here, now there, weaving in entangled circles as Trojans crowd him hard, a dense ring of them shutting him in, with a wild swamp to the left and steep walls to the right. Nor does Aeneas flag, though slowed down by his wound, his knees unsteady, cutting his pace at times, but he's still in full fury, hot on his frantic quarry's tracks, stride for stride, alert as a hunting hound that lights on a strapped stra stag hemmed in by a river's bend, or frightened back by the ropes with blood-red feathers, the hound barking, closing, fast as the quarry, panicked by traps in the steep river banks, runs off and back in a thousand ways, but the Umbrian hound, keen for the kill, hangs on the trail, his jaws agape, and now, now he's got him, thinks he's got him, yes, and his jaws clap shut, stimmied, champing the empty air. Then the shouts break loose, and the banks and rapids round resound with a din, and the high sky thunders back. Turnus, even in flight, he rebukes his men as he races, calling each by name, demanding his old familiar sword. Aeneas, opposite, threatens death and doom at once to anyone in his way. He threatens his harried foes that he'll root their city out, and, wounded as he is, as he is keeps closing for the kill and five full circles they run, and reel as many back, around and back, for it's no mean trophy they're sporting after now. They race for the life and lifeblood of Turnus. By chance, a wild olive, 
green with its bitter leaves, stood right here, sacred to Faunus, revered by men in the old days, sailors saved from shipwreck. On it they always fix, fixed their gifts to the local god, and they hung their votive cloths, clothes and things for rescue. But the Trojans, no exceptions, hallowed tree that it was, chopped down its trunk to clear the spot for combat. Now, here the spear of Aeneas had, struck, had stuck, borne ho home by its hurling force, and the tough roots held it fast. He bent down over it, trying to wrench the iron loose, and track with the spear the kill he could not catch on foot. Turnus, truly beside himself with terror. Faunus, he cried, I beg you, pity me. You, dear earth, hold fast to that spear. If I have always kept your rights, a far cry from Aeneas's men who stain your rights with war. So he appealed, calling out for the gods' help, and not for nothing. Aeneas struggled long, wasting time on the tough stump. No power of his could loose the timber's stubborn bite. As he bravely heaves and hauls, the goddess Juturna, changing back again to the charioteer Metiscus, rushes in and returns her brother's sword to Turnus. But Venus, incensed that the nymph has had her brazen way, steps up and pluck, plucks Aeneas' spear from the clinging root. So standing tall, with their arms and fighting hearts refreshed, one who trusted all to his sword, the other looming fiercely with his spear, confronting each other, both men breathless, brace for the war god's fray. Now, at the same moment, Jove, the king of mighty Olympus, turns to Juno, gazing down on the war from her golden cloud, and says, Where will it end, my queen? What is left at the last? Aeneas, the hero, god of the land, you know yourself. You confess you know that he is heaven-bound. His fate will raise Aeneas to the stars. What are you plotting? What hope can you make cling to the chilly clouds? So, was it right for a mortal hand to wound, to mortify a god? Right to restore that mislaid sword to Turnus? For without your power, what could Juturna do? And lend the defeated strength? Have done at last. Bow to my appeals. Don't let your corrosive grief devour you in silence, or let your dire concerns come pouring from your sweet lips and plaguing me forever. We have reached the limit. To harass the Trojans over land and sea, to ignite an unspeakable war, degrade a royal house, and blend the wedding hymn with a dirge of grief, all that lay in your power, but go no further. I forbid you now. Jove said no more. And so, with head bent low, Saturn's daughter replied, Because I have known your will so well, great Jove, against my own, I deserted Turnus and the earth, or else you would never see me now alone on a wind-swept throne, enduring right and wrong. No, wrapped in flames, I would be up on the front lines, dragging the Trojan into mortal, mortal combat. Juturna? I was the one, I admit, who spurred her on to help her embattled brother. True, and blessed whatever greater daring it took to save his life. But never to shower arrows, never tints the bow. I swear by the unappeasable fountainhead of the Styx, the one dread oath decreed for the gods on high. <clears throat> so, now I yield, Juno yields, and I leave this war I loathe. But this, and there is no law of fate to stop it now, this I beg for Latium, for the glory of your people, when, soon, they join in their happy wedding bonds, and wedded let them be, in packs of peace at last. Never command the Latins, here on native soil, to exchange their age-old name, to become Trojans, called the kin of Teucer, alter their language, change their style of dress, let Latium endure. Let Alban kings hold sway for all time. Let Roman stock grow, grow strong with Italian strength. Troy has fallen, and fallen let her stay, with the very name of Troy. <clears throat> Smiling down, the creator of man and the wide world returned. Now, there's my sister, Saturn's second child. Such tides of rage go churning through your heart. Come, relax your anger. It started all for nothing. I grant your wish. I surrender. Freely, 
gladly too. Lashem's son will retain their father's words and ways. Their name till now is the name that shall endure. Mingling in stock alone, the Trojans will subside, and I will add the rites and the forms of worship, and make them Latins all, who speak one Latin tongue. Mixed with Thessonian blood, one race will spring from them, and you will see them outstrip all men, outstrip all gods in reverence. No nation on earth will match the honors they shower down on you. Juno nodded assent to this. Her spirit reversed to joy. She departs the sky and leaves her clouds behind. <clears throat> his task accomplished, the father turned his mind to another matter, set to dismiss Juturna from her brother's battles. They say there are, there are twin curses called the Furies. Night had borne them once in the dead of darkness, one and the same spawn, and birthed infernal Megaria, wreathed all their heads with coiled serpents, fitting them out with wings that race the wind. They hover at Jove's throne, crouch at his gates to serve that savage king, and wet the fears of afflicted men whenever the king of God let loose horrific deaths and plagues, or panics towns that deserve the scourge of war. Jove sped one of them down the sky, commanding, Cross Juturna's path as a wicked omen. Down she swoops, hurled to earth by a whirlwind, swift as a, as a darting arrow whipped from a bowstring, through the clouds, a shaft armed by a Parthian, tipped with deadly poison, shot by a Parthian or Cretan archer, well past any cure, hissing on unseen through the rushing dark. So raced this daughter of night and sped to earth. Soon as she spots the Trojan ranks and Turnus's lines, she quickly shrinks into that small bird that often, hunched at dusk on her deserted tombs and rooftops, sings its ominous song in shadows late at night. Shrunken so, the demon flutters over and over again in Turnus's face, screeching, drumming his shield with its whirring wings. An eerie numbness unnerved him head to toe with dread. His hackles bristled in terror, voice choked in his throat. Recognizing the fury's ruffling wings at a distance, wretched Juturna tears her hair, nails clawing her face, fists beating her breast, and cries to her brother, how, Turnus, how can your sister help you now? What's left for me now, after all I have endured? What skill do I have to lengthen out your life? How can I fight against this dreadful omen? At last, I, at last I leave the field of battle. Afraid as I am, now frighten me no more, you obscene birds of the night. Too well I know the beat of your wings, the drumbeat of doom. Nor do the proud commands of Jove escape me now, our great warm-hearted Jove. Are these his wages for taking my virginity? Why did he grant me life eternal, rob me of our one privilege, death? Then for a fact, I now could end this agony. Keep, my brother, company down among the shades, doomed to live forever. Without you, my brother, what do I have still mine that's sweet to taste? If only the earth gaped deep enough to take me down, to plunge this goddess into the depths of hell. With that, shrouding her head with a gray-green veil and moaning low, down to her own stream's bed, the goddess sank away. All hot pursuit, Aeneas brandishes high his spear, that tree of a spear, and shouts from a savage heart. More delay? Why now? Still in retreat, Turnus? Why? There is no foot race, or this is no foot race. It's savagery, sword play, cut and thrust. Change yourself into any shape you please. Call up whatever courage or skill you still have left. Pray to wing your way to the starry sky or bury yourself in the earth's deep pits. Turnus shakes his head. I don't fear you, you and your blazing threats, my fierce friend. It's the gods that frighten me. Jove, my mortal foe. No more words. Glancing round, he spots a huge rock, huge, ages old, and lying out in the field by chance. P placed as a boundary stone to settle border wars, a dozen picked men could barely shoulder it up, men of such physique as the earth brings forth these days. But he wrenched it up, hands trembling, tried to heave it right at Aeneas, 
Turnus stretching to full height, the hero at speed, at peak strength. Yet, he's losing touch with himself. Racing, hoisting that massive rock in his hands and hurling. True, but his knees buckle. Blood's like ice in his veins, and the rock he flings through the air, plummeting under its own weight, cannot cover the space between them, cannot strike full force. Just as in dreams, when the nightly spell of sleep falls heavy on our eyes, and we seem entranced by longing to keep on racing on, no use. In the midst of one last burst of speed, we sink down, consumed. Our tongue won't work. And tried and true, the power that filled our body fails. We strain, but the voice and words won't follow. So with Turnus. Wherever he fought to force his way, no luck. The merciless fury blocks his efforts. A swirl of thoughts goes racing through his mind. He glances toward his own Rutulians and their town. He hangs back in dread. He quakes at death. It's here. Where can he run? How can he strike out at the enemy? Where is his chariot? His charioteer, his sister? Vanished. <clears throat> As he hangs back, the fatal spear of Aeneas streaks on. Spotting a lucky opening, he had flung from a distance all his might and main. Rocks heaved by a catapult, Pounding city ramparts never stormed so loudly, never such a shattering bolt of thunder crashing forth. Like a black whirlwind churning on, that spear flies on with its weight of iron, death to pierce the br of a uh, weight of iron death to pierce the breastplate's lower edge and the outmost rim of the round shield with its seven plies, and right at the thick of Turnus's thigh, it whizzes through. It strikes home, and the blow drops great Turnus down to the ground, battered down on his bent knees. The Rutulians spring up with a groan, and the hillsides round, groan back, and the tall groves far and wide, resounding with the long-drawn moan. Turnus lowered his eyes, and reached with his right hand and begged, a suppliant, I deserve it all! No mercy, please, Turnus pleaded. Seize your moment now, or if some care for a parent's grief can touch you still, I pray you. You had such a father, an old Anchises. Pity Donus in his old age, and send me back to my own people. Or if you would prefer, send them my dead body stripped of life. Here the victor and the vanquished. I stretch my hands to you, so the men of Latium have seen me in defeat. Lavinia is your bride. Go no further down the road of hatred. Aeneas. Ferocious in armor, stood there, still, shifting his gaze, and held his sword arm back, holding himself back, too, as Turnus's words began to sway him more and more. When all at once, he caught sight of the fateful sword belt of Pallas, swept over Turnus's shoulder, gleaming with shining studs Aeneas knew by heart. Young Pallas, whom Turnus had overpowered, taken down with a wound, and now his shoulder flaunted his enemy's battle emblem like a trophy. Aeneas, soon as his eyes drank in that plunder, keepsake of his own savage grief, flaring up in fury, terrible in his rage, he cries, Decked in the spoils you stripped from one I loved, escape my clutches? Never. Pallas strikes this blow. Pallas sacr sacrifices you now makes you pay the price with your own guilty blood. In the same breath, blazing with wrath, he plants his iron sword hilt deep in his enemy's heart. Turnus's limbs went limp in the chill of death. His life breath fled with a groan of outrage down to the shades below. The end.